On this edition for Sunday, July 7th, new threats to nuclear limits from Iran. In our signature story, the rise of anti-Semitism in France. And why the owners of a famous Utah restaurant are stepping up to protect a national monument. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The Iranian government announced today that it will enrich uranium past levels agreed to under the 2015 nuclear deal. They say international inspectors will have definitive proof of this tomorrow. And the country expects to continue going past limits every 60 days until they receive relief from economic sanctions. Uranium can be enriched for nuclear power or with far more refinement for nuclear weapons. The United States withdrew from the nuclear deal a year ago, but has exerted pressure on other signatories to not buy oil from Iran, which has had severe effects on the country's economy. Iran says these recent moves are reversible. Our negotiations are with the four plus one. If America wants to attend the talks, we think it is possible, provided that it lifts its sanctions. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted a response this afternoon saying that, quote, Iran's latest expansion of its nuclear program will lead to further isolation and sanctions. Iran's regime, armed with nuclear weapons, would pose an even greater danger to the world. World leaders quickly condemned Iran's decision. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it an extremely dangerous move and urged Europe to impose sanctions on Tehran. The German and British governments called on Iran to immediately stop and reverse its activities. French President Emmanuel Macron said his government would seek to restart talks within a week. The acting director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration said today that the White House is determined to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census, despite court rulings against it. Appearing on Fox News Sunday, Ken Cuccinelli said that the Trump administration will find a way to add the controversial question. I think the president has expressed determination. He's noted that the Supreme Court didn't say this can't be asked. They said that they didn't appreciate the process by which it came forward the first time. Cuccinelli did not offer any specifics on how the administration will add that question. For more on Iran's nuclear program and its plan to increase uranium enrichment, visit pbs.org slash newshour. In Afghanistan today, the Taliban claimed responsibility for a suicide car bombing that killed at least 12 people and wounded more than 150 others. The explosion occurred outside an intelligence department compound in Ghazni. Many of the wounded were students at a nearby high school. The attack came as an all-Afghan peace conference, which includes the Taliban, began in Qatar. U.S. Taliban talks are also underway and scheduled to resume Tuesday. I recently spoke with New York Times reporter Thomas Gibbons Neff, who also served in Afghanistan as a Marine, about the Taliban, U.S. strategy, and the growing presence of ISIS. Yeah, so I think the best way to think about uh, the war in 2019 versus, say, the war in, when I was there 2008 and 2010, it's, it's like looking through a straw, right? The, the straw in, in, you know, at the height of the war, 2010, 2011, was very large. It was all-encompassing. It was trying to take, you know, build up the Afghan military, hold territory uh, from the Taliban, and, and pretty much militarily defeat defeat the, the group. And now, I mean, the straw is kind of like the equivalent of a, of a coffee stir, right? The strategy is, you know, is killing Taliban to keep them at the negotiating table uh, while hopefully, hopefully coming to some kind of uh, peace agreement that the United States can and walk away from and, and feel comfortable about it. And, and what about the Islamic State, the rising influence of that in connection with or in concert with the Taliban? Right. So, the Islamic State in Khorasan, this affiliate that kind of uh, popped up in 2015, uh, leftovers uh, from Pakistani Taliban that kind of reflagged initially as, as a small group. And the American military kind of came out and said that as such. You know, we don't think this is a place where the Islamic State can, can fester. You know, it's, it's just some, some disgruntled uh, Pakistani Taliban or Taliban fighters that have decided to, to pick up uh, a new brand. But the, the group quickly grew, uh, you know, infused by, you know, messaging from the main, you know, Islamic State core, as it's often referred to in Iraq and Syria, uh, and, and also, you know, financially, which is, which is a huge part. And, and, and soon their brand, I guess, I, I keep going back to, to mm -hmm. using that term, uh, quickly grew. So it, it's, it's kind of turned into this own 
entity, and I, they've kind of been able to out recruit uh, the the pace in which the American military is killing them. Wow. So it, why is that recruitment so successful? I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, I think you know what, what intelligence officials kind of fall back on is that you know fighting for the Islamic State it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. Uh, they just they, they'll take kind of whoever and and atop that uh, their leadership unlike, say, compared to the Taliban, uh, is, is very focused on merit. You know, if you, you show that you have drive and are intelligent, you'll, you know, you'll gain rank quicker. You'll be, you know, kind of considered more um, important in the organization than, say, you know, in some Taliban groups where, you know, your kind of your connections are based off, you know, familial connections or, uh, you know, bribes, etc. So, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a, a whole a whole mix of stuff. But again, I mean, I think the this ability also the fact that you know ISIS in in Afghanistan is recruiting from you know urban centers like Jalalabad and Kabul, you know, disenfranchised youth coming out of universities who are kind of looking for this this cause to pick up. So it's kind of a a, a perfect maelstrom of of uh, conditions. Strategically, the U.S. military leaders that you speak with. Do they think that they can make any greater advances, especially in sort of the mountainous regions where, well, there have been resistance fighters in that region for hundreds of years? I think the strategy or what the American military is trying to do is keep them, you know, keep the, the Islamic State in Khorasan in those mountains, right? Those aren't villages per se. They aren't urban centers. They're kind of, I think they refer to it as guerrilla territory, right? I mean, you can't, you can't, logistically supply, you know, the American military, the Afghan military to go up there and stay there. You know, it's very inhospitable terrain, weather, logistics, air support. I mean, it all gets strained up in that area. So the strategy really, if you if you zoom out enough, relies on time, having enough of it to, to build that Afghan force that can handle the Islamic State. All right. Thomas Gibbons, NAFA reporter in the New York Times Washington Bureau. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. An increasing sense of emergency. That's how the president of the European Jewish Congress recently described the concern over growing anti-Semitism in Europe. That includes France, where an increase in anti-Semitic attacks has raised the alarm. News Hour Weekend special correspondent Christopher Livesay reports from Paris. La montagna, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Every Saturday for the past eight months, Thousands of people have donned yellow road safety vests and marched on the streets of Paris and other cities in France, the so-called yellow vest protests. What began as and remains a mostly economic campaign against high fuel taxes has evolved into a more wide-ranging anti-establishment protest, sometimes violent, targeting policemen, journalists, the wealthy, the French president. But what shocked many here in France is that they've also at times targeted Jews. The Yellow Vest movement is a largely leaderless one that's given a platform to people of all kinds of ideologies. Yet some people say it's that same openness that's allowed anti-Semitism to rear its ugly head. Last February, police had to step in to protect prominent philosopher Elaine Finkelkraut after he was bombarded with insults and anti-Jewish taunts. And some protesters have been spotted calling French President Macron a whore of the Jews and their puppet. Yellow Vest is a very heterogeneous movement, but it, it favors the expression of anti-Semitism because of its populist and anti-elite tones. Research professor Nona Meyer says the Yellow Vest movement, while not anti-Semitic itself, has accidentally revealed a subset of the movement that is. And statistics show anti-Semitic incidents are on the rise, up 74 percent from last year. There were 541 acts uh, according to the police counts. One third of them were actual violence against people or against a synagogue or against the house. The others were what they call threats. That means graffitis, uh, insults, intimidation. And there's another new layer to today's anti-Semitism, social media. But the reality on the web, it's not a few hundred, it's thousands, of course, every Several day, every day. Johanna Barash is assistant director of DILCRA, a government agency set up in 2014 specifically to coordinate the government's response to hate crimes, including anti-Semitism. 
She showed us some examples of anti-Semitic postings. It's supposed to be the, the hand of a Jew pushing on the people. Many are offensive, but they're not illegal. Uh, to go clearly against the law, you have to target directly uh, people, uh, uh, incite uh, violence. Or deny the Holocaust. In fact, France is one of several countries in Europe, including Germany, where Holocaust denial is a crime. This one says, today Hitler is the minimum. We need to kill more Jews, that is what it means. It, this is not easy to prosecute, but it can be argued that it is an apology for the genocide. And this is illegal. In Germany, they've just passed a law uh, in which if they don't uh, uh, take down the uh, illegal content, uh, like uh, Facebook or Twitter or any kind of platforms, then they are uh, confronted to huge fines, like a million of dollars. And you would like to be able to impose the exactly. same fines yeah, in France. Yeah. How bad is it right now? Um, it, in certain neighborhoods, I would not walk around with my kippah. Rabbi Tom Cohen is an American who's lived in Paris for the last 25 years. Though he's proud of his small synagogue, he wouldn't let us film the outside of his building. We're trying to avoid any attacks. You're trying to avoid becoming a target. Yeah, we avoid becoming a target. Exactly. That's what the security service has recommended, so we have to have guards. There's been a heightened need for security here since March 2012. A man identifying himself as a follower of ISIS targeted a Jewish day school in Toulouse, killing a rabbi and three children. After the attack of Toulouse, the French government mobilized the French army, and in this particular small synagogue, we say in Yiddish, Ashtibolach, which means a little tiny, tiny synagogue, um, I had eight soldiers living here 24 hours a day, seven days a week for four months. The, that response of the French government at the time saved my religious school because parents were afraid at that point to say, why would I send my kids to the school thinking maybe them, something might happen. France is home to the largest Jewish population outside Israel and the United States. Half a million Jews live here, many in Paris's Marais neighborhood. More recently, the 17th district just north of the Arc de Triomphe has become the new Jewish quarter of Paris with about 40,000 Jews, some of whom say they fled to the city from the suburbs because of anti-Semitism there. You do have a large number of migrants from majority Muslim countries. Does that impact at all, the, the level of anti-Semitism? It's more complicated because in the suburbs of Paris where you'll have Jews and where you'll have people who are immigrant born identified to the Palestinian cause. It's a, a very special mix of uh, social insecurity, social resentment, with the emotional trigger of what's going on in the Middle East, and then suddenly that makes them uh, gives them the possibility to defend a cause, the cause of the Palestinians. Sasha Gazlan, president of the national organization Union of French Jewish Students, helped commission a poll which he says shows how bad things really are, even at France's esteemed public Sorbonne University. What came out from this poll is that for the Jewish students specifically, 89% of them have experienced directly anti-Semitism in the university. He showed us how the office of the Jewish Student Union was ransacked last year. Long live to Arafat, death to Israel, long live to Palestine. Do we know who did this? No, we don't. The slurs were very anti-Israel. Yes. Is that the same thing as being anti-Semitic? No, I, I, actually, I mean, you can protest against the uh, um, policy of the Israeli government. That's fair, that's politics. But when you say death to Israel, that's something very particular. So people use their hate against Israel to target Jewish people here in France. And I'm fed up with tweets coming from the government saying we condemn this act. We want more act coming from the government, from the deans of university. The Jewish students have problems, but others, Islamic students, Arabic students, have problems too. Georges Haddad is president of the Sorbonne. He denounces anti-Semitism and defends his university. My university is not anti-Semitic at all, and I am the best example. I am a Jewish person from a Jewish family coming from Tunisia, and I have been twice elected president of this university. And while Haddad takes anti-Semitic acts seriously, he says the numbers on campus are marginal, two or three a year, and there isn't much that he can do about them. So in the meantime, what do you do? Discuss, dialogue. I'm not pessimistic, huh? I'm really like realistic.
Rabbi Cohen, too, believes dialogue has a place. It's one of the reasons he helps organize this interfaith choir at a nearby church. The theme of this performance? Peace, shalom in Hebrew. It's something Rabbi Cohen says his community strives for, even in the shadow of anti-Semitism, knowing there were times when things were far worse. It's not Vichy France. Um, and matter of fact, that's the one major difference I always say. The French government is 110% behind us, and we feel it. In 2017, President Trump cut the size of Utah's Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument almost in half. Subsequently, his administration's Interior Department used funds to assess opening land that was formerly part of the monument to potential oil, gas, and coal development. Last month, the Government Accountability Office confirmed it is investigating whether or not the Interior Department broke federal law in doing so. In the meantime, some local business owners, including two restaurant owners, are continuing to fight the cuts to the National Monuments on their own. NewsHour Weekend's Maury Rothman reports. In the hours between the lunch and dinner rush, Chef Jennifer Castle, co-owner of the Hell's Backbone Grill, is busy pickling cucumbers. When I came here, we had cucumbers, you know, like, what are we going to do? And I wrote my uncle and asked him for Grandpa's pickle recipe. Castle makes the most of the food she gets a skill learned after years of running a restaurant in the town of Boulder, Utah. A remote outpost surrounded by sandstone cliffs and valleys about 250 miles south of Salt Lake City. The drive to Boulder winds through steep terrain and mountain switchbacks opening to views of the surrounding plateau. It's a feast for photographers and sightseers, but offers few food options. There's nowhere to get anything, so... Only open during the warmer months between March and November, the restaurant is an experiment in sustainability and subsistence. The harsh, rapidly changing weather and the high desert can wreak havoc on local produce. It's not like massive changes, but it'll be subtle changes and sometimes it's menu changes full on. The owners of the Hell's Backbone Grill call their food place-based, cuisine matched with the local environment. You know, just like really knowing that if you go to a place and you eat that food, it's going to be terroir, it's going to be that dirt and those herbs and that rain and that mineral. The dirt and minerals diners taste are from the farm just five minutes down the road. Hi, Cricket. The farm is called Blaker's Acres, named after the other half of the Hell's Backbone Grill, co-owner Blake Spalding. If you go to Italy, they're not going to serve you New Zealand lamb and French jam and Spanish ham. They're going to serve you everything delightful from that place. And so it's visceral. You take that place into your body, it becomes part of you, you know. I believe we were the first farm to table restaurant in the Rocky Mountain Southwest, but no one, to my knowledge, was doing it in a rural setting. And so I wanted to show that it could be done in a rural setting. And I wanted to sort of use the food here to help people fall in love with this incredible, you know, precious, majestic, fragile landscape. Farming thousands of feet above sea level isn't easy. Fierce winds blow the soil around and special tents have been built to protect crops. Despite the challenges, the farm grows an average of 23,000 pounds of produce a year. We grow all of our own table flowers. We grow edible flowers. We grow potatoes, chilies, tomatoes, green beans. Hell's Backbone Grill has become one of the region's premier culinary destinations. Looks beautiful, you guys. So beautiful. It's been a James Beard Award semifinalist multiple times and was named the best restaurant in southern Utah by Salt Lake Magazine. Blake and Jennifer have also published two books sharing the restaurant's cuisine and recipes. But people don't just come to Hell's Backbone Grill for the food. The farm sits in the shadow of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument a stretch of streaked rock formations, rivers, and gorges nearly twice the size of Rhode Island, rising like a staircase from the Grand Canyon. It's a place where visitors could hike, camp, and embrace the remoteness of the desert, knowing it would always be preserved. Our parents and grandparents saved the Grand Canyon for us. Today, we will save the Grand Escalante Canyons and the Kaparowitz Plateaus of Utah for our children. Grand Staircase was designated as a national monument by President Bill Clinton in 1996, 
protecting the area from mining and other extractive industry. I've come to Utah to take a very historic action to reverse federal overreach and restore the rights of this land to your citizens. In December 2017, President Trump issued an executive order shrinking Utah's Grand Staircase Escalante Monument and nearby Bears Ears Monument by almost 2 million acres. It was the largest reduction of federal land protection in U.S. history. That is the Kaiparowitz Plateau, and sadly, that's part of what just got axed out. Spalding says the reduction was devastating, and she was moved to take action. She wrote an editorial in the Salt Lake Tribune protesting the order and has banded together with local business owners to stop it. We had a, letters from 150 local businesses all asking him, begging him not to touch the monument because our livelihood is inextricably linked to its demise. Why are we prioritizing, you know, oil and gas and extractive industry in public lands when we have a booming economy here that has arisen out of the economics of a new wet way in the West, which is um, quiet use tourism. But for Spalding, the fight is about more than business. It's about protecting a space for others to come and experience the sense of wonder she felt when she came here 20 years ago. Our sort of working business model from the beginning was to be a warm hearth, you know, metaphorically, that people could gather around before they go in to have a transformative wilderness experience. I mean, I would have never in my wildest dreams imagined the kind of response we've had. I mean, we get people sent us presents in the mail and love letters. And it's not us, it's because of the power of this place combined with a lovingly prepared meal that is of this place. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Sunday. Greek voters chose Kyriakos Mitsotakis of the center-right New Democracy Party over the country's current prime minister, Alexis Tsipras, in parliamentary elections today. The prime minister called a snap election three months early after his party was defeated in the European Union's elections in May. This is the first election in Greece since an economic crisis required a series of international bailouts. Tens of thousands of protesters in Hong Kong marched to a high-speed rail station that connects to mainland China today. Wearing black shirts and carrying British colonial flags, the demonstrators said they wanted mainland Chinese visitors to know about a now-suspended bill that would allow extraditions to China. The protests remained peaceful and carried over into Hong Kong's shopping district, a popular tourist destination. Billionaire financier Jeffrey Epstein, once friendly with former President Clinton and President Trump, was arrested last night and charged with sex trafficking. Epstein is a registered sex offender after pleading guilty to state charges of soliciting prostitution and serving 13 months in a Florida county jail. The deal was controversial and came from then-prosecutor Alexander Acosta's office. He is now the Secretary of Labor. The new charges allege the trafficking of dozens of minors between 2002 and 2005. Epstein is currently being held in New York City's Metropolitan Correction Center and is expected to appear in federal court in Manhattan tomorrow. Aftershocks continue today in California at a pace of about one per minute. In Trona, a city of about 2,000 people near the epicenters of the two major quakes that hit Thursday and Friday, food stores are still closed. Water supply is limited, but electricity is now restored. Seismologists predict the region could experience 30,000 smaller aftershocks over the next six months. Finally tonight, the U.S. women's soccer team won their record-breaking fourth World Cup championship in a 2-0 victory over the Netherlands. While fans across the United States celebrated at watch parties, the stadium in France was filled with chants of equal pay, equal pay as the head of the International Soccer Federation took the stage. The U.S. women win much more, yet earn less money and receive fewer resources than the U.S. men's team. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.